All right, it looks like our numbers have, have kind of studied, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. My name is Jean Van Orstel, and I am a quality specialist with the National Center on Early Childhood Quality Assurance. And I'm here today to just start us off with the Ask the Pediatric Expert Safe Sleep webinar. And I'm so excited, so excited that Dr. Moon is here today and is going to be sharing information with you. I have worked with her over the years and she is just a treasure for all of you to be able to hear. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Moon and I will let you get started. Oh, before I start, I'm sorry. See, I said I was gonna talk about the questions and I've already forgotten. Um, we do have all of your questions for those of you that submitted questions. And the, there is quite a few of those questions that will be covered within the webinar itself. The rest of them, we've um, put them together and kind of grouped them to, to topics. And we will start addressing those after we get through the slide deck. And in the meantime, Social Salvador, thank you very much for being here today, Social, is here from the American Academy of Pediatrics. And Social will be dropping some resource, um, resources into the chat box for you as well that will help to respond to some of those questions. So now I will turn it over to you, Dr. Moon. And if you could go ahead and tell a little bit about yourself as well, I'm sure everyone's excited you're here. Thanks, Jean. I'm excited to be here as well. Um, you all are near and dear to my heart because you take such good care of our children. And so thank you for all that you do. Um, and you guys are truly on the front lines. And um, and I know that you often don't feel as though you pre are appreciated. I appreciate you and I just want you to know that. Um, so, um, so I'm gonna be talking about safe sleep and um, I am a pediatrician. Um, I see patients every, every day um, and I'm at the University of Virginia and I am also um, a researcher on the topic of SIDS and sudden, uh, infant, uh, sudden unexpected infant death. And, um, and I'm also chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics Task Force on SIDS. Um, and so what I'm gonna be sharing with you all today is um, is uh, the updated guidelines and um, and some of the newer things that are there. Some of the you know remind you of some of the old all these but goodies and um, and then uh, try to answer as many questions as we can get to. Um, okay, so I have nothing to disclose. The first thing I wanted to do is to just um, acknowledge and um, express my appreciation for the other members of the task force. Um, this is all of us, um, such a great group of passionate, dedicated people um, who, uh, you know, this is their, this is their life's work. And, um, and so I just wanted to, to thank them all for all that they do. Um, so the, the objectives of today's talk is to give you a little bit of an understanding of why, the kind of the why behind the, um, the guidelines. So understand why babies die in their sleep and to discuss the 2022 changes in the safe sleep guidelines that most relate to childcare settings. So for instance, um, since uh, uh, bed sharing childcare is not, um, an, you know, is, uh, is not something that happens in childcare, I'm not gonna talk about that one, uh, that today. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about definitions and pathophysiology. It's not gonna be scary, I promise you. Um, so just to start um, with some definitions so we're all on the same page, I just want to mention this term SUID, um, which is sudden unexpected infant death. And it is exactly what it sounds like. It is when an infant who is um, somebody who is younger than 12 months old dies suddenly and unexpectedly. In the literature, you'll also see it as sudden and unexpected death in infancy or SUDI. Um, so when we think about sudden and unexpected infant death, um, the vast majority of them happen during sleep or it, when the baby is in a sleep environment. And so you may also hear the term sleep-related death. Um, about a quarter of them are uh, determined to be accidental suffocation or strangulation in bed. And then the rest of them are SIDS and ill-defined deaths. Um, in terms of the trends in sudden and unexpected um, infant death, um, 
over the last 20, 30 years, you can see that initially there was a huge decline in the rate of SIDS and that it has continued to decline. Um, but you'll also see that these unknown cause deaths and the accidental suffocation deaths have increased over time so that really since around 1996 or so, there has not been any change in the sewage rate overall. And this is of concern because what we think is going on is many of the deaths that used to be called SIDS are now being called unknown or ill-defined cause or um, accidental suffocation and strangulation in bed. Um, in terms of um, race and ethnicity, um, there are huge disparities still. Um, so you can see here the orange line is, is non-Hispanic white. Um, and then down here is Hispanic and Asian Pacific Islander. And then um, up here is non-Hispanic black and um, American Indian Alaska Native. Um, just excuse me, I just need to check this text for one quick thing. OK. Um, and so. Um, and so you can see that there are huge um, disparities. A lot of these disparities are related to socioeconomic status and, um, and uh, economics because they can't afford a crib or they don't have room for a crib or, or different things like that. So, um, but there are these disparities that are there. So when we talk about SIDS, I just want to mention that um, SIDS is uh, related to asphyxia, which is a lack of oxygen or buildup of carbon dioxide in, in the system. And that has always been part of SIDS. It's generally not a death because the heart is a, there's a problem with the heart. It's generally a problem with breathing. And there are a lot of risk factors that make it harder for a baby to breathe and make it harder for a baby to get oxygen. Um, and those include sleeping on the stomach and includes soft bedding, pillows, bumper pads, and so on, and then bed sharing. And there are some situations where you're not getting enough oxygen that would cause death for any baby. So for instance, if a baby falls in between the, uh, the bed and the wall and gets smug and smushed, that baby, almost any baby would die in that situation. However, for some, some of these situations, not all babies die. So why is it that some of these babies die and some of these don't die? So um, the triple risk model is what we use to explain this. So you have a vulnerable baby um, and the vast majority of these babies are um, have some kind of brainstem defect um, that makes it hard for them to wake up, to arouse. So, um, so this is why um, a lot of these things that, um, that are related to SIDS are risk factors because it makes it harder for the baby to wake up. But some of these babies, a lot of these babies have a problem in their brain where they can't wake up. Um, and this may be genetic or it may be because of environmental factors. So for instance, we know that babies who are exposed to smoke um, smoking during pregnancy um, have more, more difficulty waking up. And then you have this baby who is a vulnerable baby and they go through a de critical developmental period and the highest risk is between one and four months, two to four months, somewhere in that range. Um, and then you take that baby that's, that's a vulnerable baby um, during this period and then you, uh, there, there's a stressor. So that may be sleeping on the stomach or sleeping on uh, the side, um, smoke exposure, as I mentioned, soft bedding, things like that. The other way to look at it is that it's an interaction between genetics, what you're born with, and then the lifestyle and environment. So this is, this is true for almost every disease out there. So for instance, if you, um, so if you take heart disease, for example, there are some people who have heart disease because their family, there's, it's a, it runs in the family, okay? But, um, and then there's also contributors in the environment and lifestyle to heart disease. So how much do you eat? Um, do you go to McDonald's every day? Do you exercise? Um, are you overweight? All of these things can contribute as well. For most people, it's a combination of these, but every once in a while, you'll have somebody who it's all lifestyle and they don't have a history of anybody in their family dying of a heart attack or having high blood pressure or anything like that. And it's all just lifestyle and environment. For other people, they, they are as healthy as can be, you know, marathon runners, they eat healthy, all of this kind of stuff, um, and drop dead of a heart attack, and that's all genetics. So the same thing is true 
um, for SIDS and for these deaths, the vast majority of them are a combination. There are a few that is all lifestyle and environment, and there are very, very few, like two or three percent, it's all genetics. Okay, so in terms, so when I talked about vulnerable babies and about brain dysfunction, so Hannah Kinney is a neuropathologist up at Boston, and she and her colleagues have found abnormal, abnormalities and autonomic control in the brain stem. So this is all of the things that you do automatically. And so that what they found is that there are decreased neurotransmitters in the brain stem of babies who die of SIDS. And these are things, these are chemicals like serotonin, which you may have heard of, um, and some other ones. And there's this whole network dysfunction. And so these babies may not be able to sense and react when there's too much uh, carbon dioxide in their system or there's not enough oxygen in their system. The other thing is that other researchers have, have found changes in the genes that are responsible for serotonin transport. And so that what they found is that babies who have um, have differences in these genes or have problems with, they have decreased neurotransmitter of the, the serotonin in their system. And up to 70% of these babies have problems with, with neurotransmitters. And these are not seen in babies who die of other causes. So this may seem like a weird slide, but this is a like an MRI scan that shows um, serotonin binding in two babies. This baby here is a baby that died of SIDS. Um, and then in panel C, this is a baby who did not, who died of something else. And you can see this green and blue and all of this, this is all serotonin receptor binding. And you can see there's a ton of it in this baby who died of something else. And there's virtually none of it in this baby who died of SIDS. So there are differences like that in these babies that can help to, to contribute to these deaths. Um, we know that the serotonin has so many, so, does so many things for our body. So it helps us control our upper airway. It helps us breathe. It helps us to, uh, control our temperature, our heart rate, our blood pressure. And then it also helps with sleep and arousal. So there's so many things that, that, um, that can cause this. The thing is you can't tell by just looking at them who, which baby has a problem with a gene defect or a serotonin defect or anything like that, you can't tell. And there's no test that we can do to look at that. Um, but what happens with these babies is that they, they don't wake up, they can't arouse. So for instance, if you have a baby who's laying face down and they're really suffocating, um, you know what should happen is that they wake up a little bit to turn their head or to lift their head, okay? But they can't do this. They fail to arouse and then they get worse and worse and then they eventually die, okay? Um, and so this is what happens when you don't wake up. So for everybody, so a baby that is not vulnerable, there's this risk between protection and um, there's a balance between protection and risk, okay? So there are uh, protective factors and there are risk factors. And the idea is that you wanna stay above this line because you wanna stay in health because disease, when it comes to um, sudden un unexpected death, it, there's no way to diagnose this um, uh, ahead of time. Um, and the only way that the, the disease is, is found out is if a baby dies, okay? Um, and so if you are vulnerable, then it kind of tips the balance. So you're like right here, okay? Because the vulnerability is a, is a huge risk for you. So it doesn't take much to tip you into that disease section. And there's a question here, if the nursing mother takes melatonin to help her sleep, will that impact the baby's serotonin? We don't know that, that, that that's true, but I don't think that there've been any studies of that. Okay, so risk factors are risk factors because of two reasons. One, they make it more difficult for the baby to wake up. So these are things like sleeping on your stomach, sleeping on your side, smoke exposure, um, and then back sleeping, breastfeeding, room sharing without bed sharing, pacifier use, all make it easier for you to wake up. This is why nobody wants the babies to sleep on their back because they wake up. But the waking up is what is protective for the baby. So we want the babies to wake up more frequently. We want the babies to arouse more frequently. We want them to startle more frequently because that is protective. 
Okay, um, room sharing without bed sharing is protected because every time the baby makes the sound, the parent moves and makes a little, maybe moves and, and stirs. And every time the parent stirs, the baby um, will stir and wake up a little bit. And that is protective. The other reason risk factors are risk factors is because they create potentially, they create environments where you can potentially not get enough oxygen. So sleeping on your stomach, bed sharing, sleeping on your side, soft bedding. These are some pictures of that you may have seen anywhere. You may have posted a picture like this, but these are all pictures of environments that can potentially cause asphyxia, cause a lack of oxygen, trouble breathing. So when you have vulnerability plus unsafe sleep, then that tips you over into this disease category. So these are the recommendations for, um, for safe sleep. So place the baby on the back every sleep, use a firm sleep surface, and now we've uh, added a flat sleep surface, so not inclined. Breastfeeding is recommended, recommended. Room sharing with the infant on a separate um, sleep surface is recommended. Keep soft objects and loose bedding away from the baby. Um, offer a pacifier. Avoid smoke exposure. Avoid alcohol and illicit drug use. Avoid overheating. So when we look at these um, recommendations, all of these ones that are, that are now bolded in red, these all impact arousal, okay? All of these recommendations all make it more difficult for the baby to breathe, okay? Or well, actually, these actually decrease the risk of that so that, that makes it um, less likely that they're gonna have trouble breathing. Okay, let's see. So what we wanna do is use safe sleep to tip the balance for these vulnerable babies. And again, we can't tell which babies are vulnerable just by looking at them or by doing any tests. So we want to use safe sleep, which is a protective factor to, to tip that balance back up into the healthy region. So again, the goals of the safe sleep guidelines are to increase arousability, make it easier for the baby to wake up and decrease those environments that make it difficult for the baby to get enough oxygen. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about what's new in the 2022 guidelines. So here are the oldies but goodies. Babies should be placed on their, uh, for sleep on their back for every sleep by every single caregiver. In a crib, a bassinet or a portable crib that meets federal safety standards and nothing in the sleep space but the baby. We wanna feed babies human milk as much and as long as possible. So that's breast milk. We want to provide a smoke and nicotine free environment before and after delivery, avoid alcohol, opioids, marijuana, and illicit drugs before and after delivery, offer pacifier at sleep time. Um, I wanna remind you that when babies are on their back, that does not increase their risk of choking. So here on the left, um, is a baby that's on their back. And you can see that the esophagus or the feeding tube, the food tube that goes down to the stomach is below the trachea, which is the windpipe, which goes into the lungs. So if a baby is on their back and they spit up, then the food actually has to go up, go come up the esophagus, go up against gravity to go into the lungs for that to cause aspiration. So if the baby is on their stomach, the esophagus is on top of the trachea. And so if they spit up, then the food is just gonna go bleep, like right down into the lungs. So just anatomically, it is easier for you to choke on your food and to aspirate if you are on your stomach than if you are on your back. There are now new safety standards for sleep surfaces. So we recommend a crib, bassinet, portable crib, or a play yard that conforms to these safety standards. So at a minimum, any, anything that is other than a crib, bassinet, portable crib, or play yard, or what we call an alternative sleep surface, has to, has to adhere to the 2021 CPSC rule that any sleep product has to meet existing federal safety standards for one of these four categories, okay? Um, so these alternative sleep surfaces include 
inclined sleep products, anything that's at a slant, hammocks, baby boxes, in-bed sleepers, baby nests, baby pods, compact bassinets without a standard legs, travel bassinets, and baby tents. And if they do not meet the federal safety standard, then they're probably not safe for sleep and they're not recommended. So what does this mean? So, um, so this rule, this consumer product safety rule applies to any sleep product for babies who are five months and younger. So, so this a sleep product is defined as any product that has packaging, marketing, or instructions indicating that the product is for sleep or naps or if any of those packaging, marketing, or instructions have any pictures of sleeping babies. So if that is the case, then it, it is categorized as a sleep product and it has to meet the um, standards for either a crib, bassinet, play yard, or a bedside sleeper. So here are examples of some alternative sleep surfaces. So you can see here, best sleeper baby, baby box sale, um, it conforms to this international gold standard for crib and cradle safety, which I've never heard of. Um, baby loungers, um, this one. So, so many, these are all alternative safe uh, sleep surfaces. So they have to, um, so they have to, um, to adhere to those, those safety standards. Okay, and we have, you have to be, and, and the manufacturers are tricky. So here's a popular product, and this is a website, uh, um, a picture on the website of May the 10th, 2021. So this is a sleeping baby. So this would be categorized as a sleep product. Okay, so the, the new, new um, rule went to effect June 1st. This is the website on June the 2nd. So all of a sudden, it's not, they're, they're saying it's not a sleep product, but I bet you know a lot of parents who are using this product um, for their baby to sleep in. So there's another, um, another law that was just passed um, in May of this year, um, the Safe Sleep for Babies Act. And this law makes it unlawful to manufacture, sell or distribute crib bumpers or inclined sleepers for babies. Okay, so inclined sleepers for babies are those designed for a baby up to a year of age and has um, an incline of more than 10, 10 degrees. And then the crib bumpers are, are the padded materials that, um, that are, that are um, go around the crib. Um, interestingly, they do not include unpadded mesh crib liners. And this all, part of it came about because um, Consumer Reports reported um, 73 deaths that, um, that came to market of uh, babies that, um, of deaths that um, in inclined sleep products. Okay, so the inclined, the, the 10 degrees or less, that came from this analysis that, that was done where they took babies and they put them in inclining cribs um, at different degrees. And what they found, um, and they also tested them in these products, many of which may be familiar to you. And what they found was when a baby is in an inclined sleep product, they can roll more easily from the back to the front because they can, tr they can flex their trunk, they can bend their trunk forward, and then and they can more easily lift their head. But when they were at a 20 degree angle, those babies got tired faster because it's harder to keep straight if you're at an angle, if you're at an angle, at a slant, and it's harder to keep your head up um, and to keep your airway straight. So it, they needed to use more abdominal muscles. They needed to adjust their head, their trunk, and their neck more, and they were more likely to have problems with their oxygen levels um, within 60 seconds of being put on one of these inclined products. And so, um, so it. It leads it so these babies get more tired and they're higher risk for suffocation if they are at an incline. But if they were at a 10 degree incline or less, then they were fine. So all sleep surfaces have to be firm. And by firm, I mean hard, like hard as a rock. If you press down on it with your hand, your hand should not go down um, in uh, on the mattress. And it means flat, which means horizontal, which means not, not um, tilted at all. Never, ever, ever 
have a baby sleep on a couch or an armchair. These are extremely dangerous places, probably the most dangerous places for babies to sleep. They should never be used for sleep either with or without another person. Never, ever, ever. Okay. We don't want bedding below, on top of, or around the baby. And there should be no bumper pads or similar products that attach to crib or sides, crib slats or sides. Um, if you worry about the baby being cold, then you can dress the baby in layers of clothing. That is better than putting blankets or other coverings in the sleep space to keep the baby warm. It's gonna be much safer if they're in multiple layers. Um, and just as a reminder, all of these recommendations um, are until the baby is a year of age. Okay, you can also use wearable blankets, um, but again, nothing underneath, on top of, or near the baby because they can obstruct the baby's um, airway and it increases the risk for suds and suffocation. So these are, here's a, a, um, a diagram of what can happen. And then this is a, a picture of a baby that, that actually died. Um, we don't recommend weighted blankets and swaddles, okay? So here's the reason for that. The baby's rib cage does, is not bony yet. It's still cartilage. And so you can you press on it and it, it deforms, it, it, it compresses. So if you add weight to the chest, that's gonna make it harder for that baby to breathe because you're, you're um, putting pressure on their chest and their rib cage is gonna collapse a little bit. There are no standards for weighted blankets and swaddles. So it can be up to a pound of added weight, which is more than 12% of a newborn's body weight, which is too much. Even the weighted blanket people say less than 10% of your body weight, okay? Um, and if the baby rolls onto their stomach, they could have difficulty rolling back. Um, there is potential for overheating, and there is no published evidence that support their, the manufacturer's claims that these products are safe for babies. Um, so there was one study of 16 babies who had um, neonatal abstinence syndrome. So they were born to mothers who had opioid use, um, who would use opioids. And they, they, um, they did um, a study where they watched them for 30 minute intervals, 30 minutes with a weighted blanket, 30 minutes without one. And they did that a couple of times and they and the babies were fine with that, but that's the only study that has ever been done. They've never done it with babies who have not had medical problems and they've never done it in a situation like they would be in daycare or at home. Normal sleep sets without the weights are fine, but just not the weights, okay? A Merlin sleep suit is considered a weighted sleep blanket. And then there's another question when you say nothing underneath the baby, um, that is not including tightly fitted sheets because um, uh, that is fine. So we're talking about um, soft things. Are there any benefits to weighted blankets and swaddles? Um, there are some case reports of uh, potential benefits for children with autism spectrum disorder or attention deficit disorder. Um, but, but if you look at the objective studies where they actually measure sleep quality and quantity, there's been no difference. And so the American Academy of Neurology has found that there's no evidence to support um, using weighted blankets um, for children with autism spectrum disorder. And on the website, you will often see claims saying that they, they, um, they're good for serotonin or melatonin, or, and there's no evidence for that. Um, there are no articles we, we looked. There are no articles for using weighted blankets and measuring either of those levels. And actually, babies don't produce melatonin in the first early, the first few months of life until um, until they're sleeping night and day in um, a circadian rhythm. Okay, so there was a voluntary standard about weighted blankets that was um, that was on a ballot. Um, so. The way, that, the way that these voluntary standards are created is that the manufacturers decide what they're gonna do. So they create the standard. So it's a little bit like the fox um, uh, protecting the, the, the hen house. Um, but even in this voluntary standard, um, they said that the minimum recommended user weight should never be less than 30 pounds, okay? Um, so every baby under, 12 months of age is probably less than 30 pounds. So, um, so we would not recommend it. And even they in their proposed uh, standards would not 
would not recommend it. Okay. Um, so direct to consumer uh, heart rate and pulse ox monitors. Um, so these are include those the wearable monitors. And um, so these are sold as in a specific FDA category of consumer wellness device. So this is like your um, your fitness tracker. Um, so they're intended for encouraging a, way, a healthy lifestyle, um, but they are not supposed to diagnose, cure, improve, prevent, or treat a condition. And wellness devices don't meet the same regulatory requirements as medical devices. So just like you would not depend upon your fitness device to prevent you from having a heart attack, you cannot prevent, you cannot use one of these devices, these wearable monitors to prevent a baby from dying of SIDS. Um, and the studies have shown that they do not detect babies at risk for SIDS. One study sh showed that 2.5% had um, rapid heart rates. They were able to detect rapid heart rates, but they couldn't confirm that by EKG. By mon um, and so they may be events that just don't matter. And we don't know what that means. Um, and there was a study several years ago that showed that these monitors are not as reliable or accurate at identifying significant events and important events. Okay, so there is no contraindication to using these and they may give parents peace of mind, but there's also no data to support their use with regards to reducing the risk of, of death. Um, and we get worried because if you use them, you might become complacent and then and say, oh, the baby's got the monitor on, it's okay if we put them on the back or on the stomach, or the baby's got the monitor on, so it's fine if we put, uh, cover them with a blanket. And so, um, so if a family decides to use monitors, that should not be considered a substitute for following safe sleep guidelines. We do recommend pacifiers, um, and because uh, they have been very, very protective. Um, we think that it's because they either help to modify how the how you're breathing, um, or they help to maintain your airway um, and keep it open while you're sleeping. If the pacifier falls out after the baby falls asleep, they don't have to be put back in. Um, and Pacifier use doesn't uh, impact on breastfeeding at all, um, but some people still worry about that. So now we're providing specific guidelines about this. So wait, and if you are breastfeeding, directly breastfeeding on the breast, then you wanna wait until you have enough milk, you are making enough milk, um, you have a good latch and your baby is gaining weight. Um, and if that, that usually is in the first couple of weeks of life, um, but it can be variable. Tummy time is a big thing in daycare um, and we want babies to be in tummy time. Um, we have not had recommendations because there hasn't been any evidence before about how much and how long to do tummy time. Um, but now uh, there is evidence and so now what we're saying is to start as soon after the baby comes home from the hospital and then increase to at least 15 to 30 minutes a day um, by seven weeks of age. And that's because there are these, um, there have been a few studies. There, there's a Dutch study that showed that if babies had tummy time less than three times a day before seven weeks of age, they were more than twice as likely to develop a flat head. Um, there's a US study that showed that if they had at least 15 minutes of tummy time every day, then they um, could lift their head up and sit with their head steady um, earlier. And then there was a, a Taiwanese study that showed that um, at least 30 minutes a day of tummy time by three to four months was associated with, um, uh, with earlier acquisition of some uh, gross motor milestones. Okay, so that's what I have for my presentation. Um, in conclusion, baby on the back on a flat, non-inclined sleep surface with nothing but the baby. Use only Consumer Product Safety Commission approved sleep devices. No couches, sofas, or stuffed armchairs. No weights on the baby. Um, use layers of clothing for warmth. No tobacco, vaping, alcohol, marijuana, or opioids. Monitors don't replace safe sleep guidelines. And then, um, and then we provided more specific guidelines for starting pacifiers and starting tummy time. Okay, so I am going to, I think we can stop sharing the screen. Um, 
And then I'm going to start with some of the questions that have come up in that were submitted already. And then um, somebody can help me with the ones that have been put in the chat. Does that sound OK? OK, so um, so one question is, um, what if a baby rolls over while they're sleeping? So if a baby is um, if if they've rolled over and they can't roll back by themselves, you haven't been seeing them roll back, then we would recommend that you put them back on their back, okay? Um, if they can roll front to back and back to front, then you can leave them where they are. I would remind you that, um, that to get everything out of the baby's sleep space, um, because if they roll, the, the biggest risk when they roll is if they roll into something and then they can't roll back out. So they roll into a bumper pad, they roll into a pillow, they roll into a, a blanket. Um, so, um, so make sure that the, the sleep space is clear. Um, I, we got several questions about floor beds or mattress or, or floor mats. Um, and I think that, you know, if they are um, firm, um, the, the, that should be fine. Um, I don't see any reason why that those could not be used. Um, we got uh, several questions about cradle boards. Um, there's no evidence behind, there have been no studies about cradle boards. Um, theoretically, they seem to be fine. Um, and culturally, they are very well accepted in, in many uh, Native American communities. Um, the NICHD, the Safe to Sleep campaign does um, offer, um, suggest cradle boards as a, as a reasonable alternative, and we would agree with that. Um, in terms of videos, I think that, um, I think social put up a, um, a link for videos. I'm actually gonna put up another one for videos for um, what happens when babies are, um, when babies uh, sleep with their uh, bed share. Um, these videos come from um, Baltimore where they've had a huge problem with um, infant death um, in bed sharing situations. And so they have um, several videos that talk about that they're showing to, um, to actually the whole community. They're, they're showing them at well baby visits, they're showing them during pregnancy, they're showing them at the DMV, they're showing them at um, uh, when, um, when people go for jury duty, all sorts of creative places that they're showing them to try to get the message that sleeping with your baby is not safe. Um, okay, uh, let's see, anything else? Um, here. Um, when babies have congestion, would it be beneficial to keep the head elevated during sleep? I hope that the information that I presented about how it's harder for babies to breathe when, and to, to keep their oxygen levels up when, they're, um, when their head is up um, explains why you should not el elevate the head of their bed when they have congestion because that just makes it worse for them. Um, okay, what happens if a baby falls asleep while being held on the playground? Um, keep holding them. And then when you get to a place where you can put the baby um, back in their crib, then that's fine. But when you're holding them, you wanna make sure that, that their um, face and neck are uncovered and free um, of obstruction and, um, and don't have them curled up um, so, that, so that their airway can get kinked. Um, there's one question about the AAP breastfeeding policy was released as well, but the recommendation about length of breastfeeding is different. We say one year, they say two. The main reason is because our recommendations stop at one year because SID stops at one year. Um, so we say actually um, uh, exclusive breastfeeding for six months and then, breast, and then uh, continued uh, breastfeeding with supplemental foods um, for uh, until the baby is a year of age or as long as um, uh, both parent and child want to do it. So that is actually consistent with the AAP breastfeeding um, guidelines. Um, okay. I think those are the main ones for that were sent in. Um, Somebody want to, do you want me to go through the chat or just has somebody so, already gone? So I it? pulled a few of those out, Dr. Moon. And so one of them is, do they need a doctor's note saying they can roll back and forth? That is a good question. Um, I have never been asked for a doctor's note saying that they can be, that they can roll back and forth. 
Um, I would I would ask uh, your um, the child care regulatory agency to see if they have rules about that or not. I don't know about that. It's a good question. Um, and then are pacifiers okay to be in the crib with the child? Yes, that is fine. And then um, another question that was brought up is, are sleep products required to show compliance with CPSC standards on their product websites or in any other means? No, they're not required to. They usually will because they consider that a good thing. Um, but they usually, so, so if they, so they don't have to, but if they don't, then I would be worried that they, if they don't show it, I'd be worried that they don't adhere to it because if they adhere to it, then they would show it. Does that, I hope that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Is the sleep sack with, or the sleep blankets with arms okay? The yes. Ones with the arms. Yes. Okay. yes, that's fine. With arms or with arms out, arms in, it doesn't matter. Okay. If a but, baby, but, but, but in terms of swaddling, if babies are starting to roll, you definitely want their arms out. Okay. You don't want to swaddle them arms down if they are starting to roll, because if they roll, then, then they have no way to, to protect themselves if their arms just are swallowed in. Okay. If a pediatrician gives approval for a medical reason, would that be acceptable for child care? And this is going back to those weighted blankets um, and then uh, it looks like and propping infants in car seats or cribs upon a note that the pediatrician has provided to the parent. That's a hard one. I... I have a hard time with these notes mm -hmm. um, because I just have a hard time with these notes because I don't feel that they are often in the best interest of the baby. Um, they're in the best interest of the parent. Um, and so I, again, I would refer to your regulatory agencies because different agencies, different states have different rules about whether or not a baby can be placed, you know, for instance, on their stomach if they have a doctor's note. Um, some, some states allow it with a parent's note. So I would defer to your um, state licensing agency about that. Um, yeah. Okay. And um, the next question is, at what age does the risk of SIDS decrease and why? So the, the, um, so the highest risk is between about one and four months. 90% of the deaths occur before six months. So, um, so at around six months, they do decline um, significantly. And what about the little toys that attach to the pacifiers, like a monkey or a caterpillar that the child holds while having a pacifier in their mouth? Um, I consider those that soft um, and they're smushy. Um, you know, really anything, if you put it against the baby's face and it blocks their airway, shouldn't be there. Makes sense. Can the layers of clothing include a sleep sack? Oh, we already got that one. Okay. <laughs> um, and then we have pediatricians recommending elevating head with for reflux using the wedges. And the question then becomes, is that not safe? That is not safe. Um, and actually it doesn't do anything for the reflux. So, um, the studies have shown that if a baby's on their back and they are the elevated, the head is elevated, it doesn't do a single thing for reflux. Um, and um, and as I showed, it makes it much harder for the babies to keep their airways open. So even the the doctors that are experts in reflux, the gastroenterologists, they have said that babies with reflux should not be elevated. Um, and should not be placed on their stomach unless the risk of, of um, death from reflux is higher than the risk of SIDS. 
Okay. okay. And so the, the rare occasions that that would be okay would be if a baby has some anatomical problem and they can't protect their airway. So for instance, if they have a fistula, so that like there's an opening between their, um, their esophagus, their food pipe and their windpipe, um, and they can't protect their airway, then that might be a reason. Or if they have, um, if they have a, some kind of, yeah, so some, something like that, but a normal baby with reflux, um, otherwise healthy baby with reflux um, should always be on their back flat. Okay. Can you speak to overheating concerns and how using a hooded sleep sack may be problematic? So head covering has been associated with SIDS um, and overheating has been associated with SIDS in studies. The, the problem is, is that um, many of these studies were not done in the US and they were done in countries where they don't have central air conditioning and central heating. So like in Europe and in Australia. So, um, so, so it's hard to say what temperature is the perfect temperature for the baby, but we know that overheating is worse than being a little bit too cool, um, which is interesting because parents worry much more about the baby being cold than the baby being too warm. Mm -hmm. um, so um, so the, it, is, it is unclear whether or not the um, head covering is, is because of the overheating or if it's because the head covering um, uh, uh, can, can get moved and can end up blocking the airway. Um, but we don't recommend hats. We don't recommend anything on the baby, covering the baby's head when the baby is sleeping. Okay. And so um, another question that has come up and it's, I think this is a, ends up being a more general question, right? is when you have parents or a family who wants to go against what your policies are, you know, you might be using all the safe sleep policies and you have a family that wants a blanket in the, in the um, crib with the baby. Do you have any recommendations on how to approach that? Um, so I think that there is a lot of power in having a written policy whether that be from the state um, or your licensing agency, or if, it's, if they don't have one, then having your own written policy. Um, and um, because you whip out the policy and you say, I'm sorry, this is our policy. We can't do it. And you look sad and you look apologetic and you say, I'm so sorry, we can't do it. That goes against our policy. And then that that's that should be the end of the conversation. And if they keep if the parent keeps pushing, we'll say, "I'm sorry, that's our policy. There's nothing I can do about it." Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and so, can you add that pacifier should not be attached to clothing while in the crib? So the clips, I think, is what they're referencing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. My concern about the clips, um, I, they're great because they keep the pacifier from dropping on the floor, but um, you know, could it cause a strangulation risk? So if it can cause a strangulation risk, then I would say no. And um, someone asked, I may have missed this answer, but can babies be held while sleeping or in a carrier while sleeping? So babies can be held or in a carrier while sleeping. The person carrying them should be awake. So if you are going to fall asleep, and this is more the case at home, you know, parents are holding the baby and then they fall asleep. Um, hopefully you won't fall asleep while you're taking care of the babies under your charge. Um, if they are in, I'm sorry, if they are in a carrier, they, their head and neck should be um, up. So you can see them and, um, and their airway should be straight. And what about falling asleep in strollers, in car seats, in bean bags, et cetera? If they fall asleep in those, then, then we want you to move them to a flat, firm surface as soon as you can. If you are traveling, then you, know, you should keep them in the car seat, okay? Or keep them in the stroller. But if you are, 
have finished traveling, then they need to be moved out of that. Those are not safe for sleep. Um, and bean bags, no. They should never be in a bean bag asleep. So as soon as they fall asleep in a bean bag, you need to move them. And um, the, there is a question about state guidelines and I just want to address this. Yes, guidelines can differ from state to state. And so it's important for you to know what your guidelines are in your state. Um, and also just because they may be lesser than what the academy recommends for best practice does not mean you have to go with those. You can go with what's best practice and we encourage you to do that. So um, what about if, let's see, state regs usually look, and yes, as I know, yes, social, <laughs> social was kind enough to remind me that most of the states look at the AAP guidelines in order to come up to speed and make sure that they are at that same place with their licensing regulations. But um, not all of them. But not all of them, as we know. Right. Yeah. And, and states will have different regulations for um, centers and for family child care homes. Yes. And the yes. last time I looked, there are actually a couple of states that don't have regulations. And family, friend, and neighbor care is often different as well, which is the folks who are license exempt. So there's often a vast array of different yes. regulations that could cover someone. Um, and so another question is, what are the thoughts about those amber necklaces or bracelets or jewelry on infants? Um, so again, so with all of these things, uh, you need to think about, just think in generalities, um, could it cause a, a strangulation risk? Could the baby strangle while they're asleep? Um, I think with a necklace, they could. So I would take the necklace off. A bracelet, I wouldn't be so worried about because I would find it hard for a baby to suffocate or strangulate, uh, to strangle against a, a bracelet. So think about, think about the safe sleep guidelines and think about, you know, so for instance, for any kind of product um, and you're looking at a product, um, if you know what the safe sleep guidelines are, then you can evaluate whether or not you think that product would be safe or not. So if you know that it, sh it should not be on an incline, then you know that, um, and you know why, then you know that, that they shouldn't be in a car seat to sleep or a stroller to sleep. If you know that, that, um, that they, can't, they shouldn't have padding on the sides, then you know that a docket tot is not a place for the baby to sleep. Um, if you know that the, it has to be a firm surface, if you press on it and it's made out of memory foam and it sinks in with your hand, you know that that's a bad, bad product um, for the baby. So there was a, a request just to clarify. So you're saying that when a baby can roll, should be able to roll both ways before they are allowed to sleep in their position of choice. Because yes because we have had a lot of babies who have rolled on, they could roll onto their stomach, but they couldn't roll back and they roll onto their stomach and they can't get out of a situation and they die. Yeah. Um, so one, folk, or one of our participants says that we find bed sharing situations in family and in relative childcare. So are there resources available to discourage bed sharing with care providers? I don't know the answer to that. I would think that they would be the same resources that would discourage bed sharing with parents. Um, but social, I don't know that we have any, that AAP has any specific resources for bed sharing amongst child care providers. I would look more to your state regulations on that. Yeah. I doubt that that's something that would be encouraged. And that is a good question though, because I will look into that as well to see if there is anything that aligns with home visiting and maybe, you know, there's some other materials there that could be adapted. Um, so then let's see, where are we? 
we talked about the jewelry, putting it in policy helps to decrease the, the wearing of the jewelry. Um, what about East Indian cultural use of double looped cotton rope tied around abdomen, as well as cotton rope tied around one ankle? Yeah, I have not seen that. I don't know exactly what that would look like. But again, I would think about, um, does it present a strangulation risk? So if there's no way that it could come loose and wrap around the neck, then I, it's, it may be okay. But if there's even a small chance that it could, um, it could become unwrapped and, and wrap around the child's neck, then I would say no. Okay. And Sochal, I'm gonna ask, you know, do you have some things you would like to share? Because I know that you put a couple of things in the chat that I found really interesting, like about the signs on the crib. Did you wanna share a couple of those tidbits for folks? Yes, I think actually some of your um, folks here actually put that in the chat themselves, but there are some programs that have gotten really savvy because licensing reps come to visit, right? And you see sometimes they catch the baby on their stomachs and those babies are able to roll back and forth, but the licensing rep doesn't know that. So they've found ways to put signs up that say, yes, I roll back and forward so that the licensing reps don't ding them on that, as well as other teachers, right? Because sometimes you have substitute teachers coming in or someone who's not necessarily aware of what the child can do or the infant can do, and they have no idea if that child should be pushed back on their back or left alone. So those signs have been helpful for some folks. Great. Thank you, Sochal. So Dr. Moon, is there any last minute thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Because we're already out of time and I knew this hour would go so fast. No, I think I would just reiterate, you know, a lot of these questions are great questions, but um, you know, you all are very smart people and, um, and if, because it, it, you wouldn't be childcare providers if you weren't, you wouldn't be early, early care specialists if you weren't. So, so just think about the safe sleep guidelines and, um, and think about what the risk for different products would be for the baby. Um, and, um, and think about the whole idea of, um, keeping the baby's airway clear, um, and the airway straight. And then, um, and making sure the baby um, is easily arousable. And, and then most of the answers will come to you because um, it's, you know, because this is all based on, you know, if you know those things, you're gonna be able to figure out what's gonna be the safest for the baby. Great. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Moon. I know how busy you are. And yes, we will be sharing the PowerPoint. We'll take it through 508 compliance and then share it out. Thank you so much for your time today, everyone who participated and from your great, the great questions that you added to the chat box. And we're at the end of our time. So thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody.